Welcome, dear friends, to another edition of Lunch with Jordan, where conversation is alive and well, where Dan Tebow puts it all together and does an amazing job. Hello there, Danny boy. Hello, Jordan. It's good to see you again. Here we are. Good at, see. What good is for, see. What's for lunch today? Well, I've got a menu right here. You're going to love this. And if you don't know what any of this means, perhaps our guest can tell us. We've got uh, poke, loco moco, poi. And for Ooh. dessert, a, an upside-down pineapple cake. Ooh. That I made. Okay. Now, there's some serious hints right there. <laughs> see, see, yeah. see, the menu always reflects the theme of the uh, show. And before we get to our amazing and absolutely delightful, beautiful guest, uh, what's going on? What's the well, business of the day that we've got to attend to? You know that I believe that the world is a great place with good people doing awesome yes. things. Yes. And there is one person that we need to recognize today. Are you ready? I'm ready. This person did something fantastic. Ooh. Oh, you're kidding. I'm not <laughs> kidding. Everyone, we have a download in Wyoming. I don't know who it is, but this person is fantastic. We love them. Well, Kevin Costner must have gotten my message, or is he in Montana? It doesn't matter. Whoever it is, <laughs> thank you, because we've been waiting for months, years to get to all 50 states. We finally, we finally did it. All 50 states and over 120 countries, approaching 70,000 downloads on Mike with Jordan Rich. Another episode coming out at 1.15 today. With Brad Meltzer, one of my perennial guests, a terrific novelist. And I must say it's because of the Grand Tetons that we haven't been able to break through, but we broke through, <laughs> which is fantastic. I think it's time we break through and introduce the guest who chuckles delightfully as I give the menu. Dan, uh, let's bring her on, shall we? She's the one and only and amazing, beautiful Liz Bruner, ladies and gentlemen. There she is. Hello, Hello. Jordan. Hello, Dan. Hi, Liz. Good to see you. Great to see you both. Thanks for having me on, Jordan. I really appreciate it. Well, the opportunity for me, a radio guy, to introduce you, a television personality, on my quote-unquote TV program is kind of a <laughs> kick, uh, but it's delightful. We're going to have a lot of fun chatting about a lot of things. Um, one of the things we do as an icebreaker, and Dan is the brainchild here about this, is we ask the guests coming on to provide us with three quick things we didn't know about you prior. So... I don't know if you're all revved up and ready to go, but we've got some music to introduce the segment. Okay. Here it is. I always feel Ooh. like Regis. What's your final answer? All right. So <laughs> what, what well, do we not know about Liz? Well, the first thing is, has to do with your little lunch menu there that you just had. All right. Do you want to share with people what was on that menu once again? I love saying it. Poi, poke, locomoco, and pineapple cake. <laughs> Well, it's poi and it's pokey, but that's all right. <laughs> did I say poke? <laughs> yes, you did. Did I all turn right. myself around? Oh, that's a different hokey pokey. That's anyway. a different pokey. A lot of people may not know that although I was born in Connecticut, when I was less than a year old, we moved to the islands of Hawaii. And ah. so I grew up in the islands of Hawaii until I was 10. All three of my brothers were born there. And people often will ask me, well, what was it like to grow up in Hawaii? Well, I had nothing to compare it to. So yeah, it was pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. So that's perhaps one thing people may not know about me. All righty. And I now know how to pronounce pokey. Thank you. You're welcome. Number two, a lot of people may not know that I'm a classically trained singer. I sang semi-professionally for a number of years, toured Austria, Germany, Switzerland, and Greece. And uh, I've done the national anthem a number of times for, let's see, the Celtics, the Patriots, and even the Red Sox. 
and I've also performed with the Boston Pops. So maybe people don't know about that singing performance. And performing for the Pope was pretty amazing when we were in Italy. We were in Vatican Square and our sound was broadcast through the entire Vatican Square. And wow. you just felt like you were in this amazing cathedral, even though mm -hmm. we were outside. It was pretty cool. That was Pope John Paul II. You can see that photo up there. Right. And that's me with the very oh. short hair in the front row. <laughs> okay. The other thing people may not know about me, because this is a secret. Well, it's not really a secret anymore because it's in my book. <laughs> but uh, almost a year ago, I think about 10 months ago, I started taking ballroom dance lessons. I've always wanted to do it. My favorite TV show is Dancing with the Stars. Well, it's one of my favorite shows. And what I love about it, besides the, the beautiful dancing, is the transformation and the journey that the contestants take on that show. It's really, really remarkable. And one of the reasons I wanted to take dancing, ballroom dancing in particular, is I just wanted to feel, uh, find a way for, for me to allow what I felt on the inside of my body to come on out of the outside. So I'm having a lot of fun. I'm learning, let's see, tango, cha-cha, samba, salsa, waltz, and rumba. There might be one other one in there, but it's so much fun. I laugh my way through my lessons. It's really hard for me to remember the steps, though. I have to be honest. It's really, really hard. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Well, it does take two to tango, so it's you and me now going the rest All of the right. way. <laughs> Dan, any thoughts before you uh, check on things? No. I The feed is uh, the people are already on and watching and commenting, so I'm going to go check that out. I'll be back near the end of the show to tell everybody about Liz's great website and take you around there. So I'll be back in a few. All See right. you later, Thank Dan. You, sir. <laughs> Let me just preface this for those who are listening and watching from outside of the New England area, although Liz is known nationally for all kinds of things. Uh, you are uh, one of our favorite news anchors for decades mm -hmm. at Channel 5, which is the highest rated news show and uh, covered a lot. We'll chat about that. But uh, since leaving there on your own, uh, you've embarked on a terrific business opportunity to help others communicate well. We'll talk about that as well. But let's begin. There you are doing what you do so beautifully, teach people. But let's talk a little bit about your background. You mentioned Hawaii. I like the way you say that. Um, mm -hmm. But you also have a background of performance in other areas besides music. Didn't you wear a crown at one point and uh, walk oh, down the Oh, yes. Runway? Well, I, I competed in the Miss America pageant, which is a scholarship pageant. And of course, I sang for my talent, but I was Miss Illinois 1979. Oh, my goodness. It's, when I look at that photo, I laugh because I just think to myself, look at that hair. <laughs> it was my Miss America hair. And uh, I was very proud of that because it really, the opportunities that I had as Miss Illinois and the scholarship money that I earned from not only the pageant system, but also working in the dish room and those good old fashioned student loans. I paid for every penny of my education. And I'm really, really proud of that. I attended Lawrence University's Conservatory of Music, which is where I was classically trained. And so for a long time, I thought I was going to go into music and stay in music. And I did for a time. I was a high school music teacher before my television career. So now we're, we're going way far back here, Jordan. One of the things I've learned about you, having become a friend and also having interviewed you myself on my podcast when your book came out, is the importance of family. And you talk about your grandmother so beautifully in the book and your parents and so forth. Share with us a little bit about why that's so important to you today to even think about it. Well, family is very important to me, but to your point, when it came to putting my book together, Dare to Own You, Taking Your Authenticity and Dreams into Your Next Chapter, the impetus for the book was actually a quote from my grandmother, which was, no knowledge is ever wasted. And so that really was the impetus of putting everything together of all these various career chapters that I've had from being a high school music teacher to working in retail to having a 28 year television career to now having been an entrepreneur for eight and a half, almost nine years. And I talk a lot about in the book also about my lineage, about my family history and my ancestry, because we've been able to trace it back on one side of the family to when 12 families in India were converted to Christianity. And my ancestors are one of those 12 families. We also have been able mm -hmm. to trace it back to them arriving from the Mayflower 
And so when I think about the fact that I'm living in Boston, when the Mayflower came to Boston, you know, and, and landed in Plymouth Rock, I mean, I've got some pretty deep New England roots, I have to say. And family Absolutely. is really important to me. Yeah, and I've had a chance to meet some of them. They're great people, and they're so proud of you. Uh, you know, television is a competitive game, and uh, most people wind up on the tube in a major market, you know, spending a lot of time in what we call the tall grass in some of the smaller markets. Your pathway to television is is unique. I don't think I've heard it told by anybody else like yours. Just in brief terms, how did you get that first gig? I bravely and blindly called up two television stations in Champaign, Urbana, Illinois, which was where I was living at the time, a CBS affiliate and an NBC affiliate. And I went on an informational interview with both of them. And long story short, Reader's Digest version, a position was ultimately created for me at the CBS affiliate. And I was there for three years, learned everything on the job. It really was my graduate school. Then I got called to Tampa, Florida, which was another CBS station. And again, I was there for five years and had many opportunities to be on the air as well as behind the scenes in upper management. And I was the only female in upper management. And then I got called to Boston and I was at Channel 5 in Boston for 20 years. So cumulatively, 28 years in the industry. Dare to Own You is the title of your book. You took some risks and you were you were in very courteous, polite ways, very forward. You you stood for yourself and said, I would like to work here. That that actually works occasionally. Well, I, I don't know how, if that would even happen today in terms of people calling up and asking for an informational interview. I didn't know, did I need to go back to college and get another degree in journalism? Or did I need to have more experience? I had only done one television commercial, Jordan, when I was Miss Illinois. And it was for Pontiac Grand Prix. It was my favorite car at the time. And I had the opportunity to have four different cars that I got to drive during my reign as Miss Illinois. But that was really my only television experience, unless you count the Miss America pageant, which was a live show. But that was it. And I thought, well, I wonder if I could do something in television. I wonder if there would be some way to do something in public relations. I really had no clue. And then one thing led to another once I got started. Somebody this, gave me a chance, and that doesn't happen very often. Somebody gave me a chance. This from a young lady who uh, tells us in her own story that uh, you were plain Jane as a teenager. I find that hard to believe. <laughs> but uh, I was you, an ugly you, duckling. Oh, my gosh. Okay. <laughs> Obviously, you turned into a swan, but uh, it, it, what? Do, uh, there's a picture of you with President Obama. We'll talk about that in yeah. one second. Leave it up there, Dan, if you would. But... Um, the, the transformation that you went through to get all the way to the top of the heap in terms of the, the beauty pageant world representing the state of Illinois is huge. What did that teach you? What did that experience in that year teach you about poise, about communication, about stature, things like that? Well, you learn a lot of those things. And I think also I'm going to go backwards even further into my childhood. My father was a minister. My mother was a social worker. And I was always in the church choir. I was always up in front of congregations. So I had a little bit of experience, if you will, being in the quote unquote public eye, just being in front of a congregation, in front of other people. And then with all of my theater experience in high school and performing in concert choir and things like that, again, in front of an audience. And all those things teach you something, whether it's debate, whether it's acting, whatever it is, singing, all of those things have the opportunity to teach you poise, to teach you confidence, to teach you presence, to teach you how to be in front of an audience. And so when I became Miss Illinois, I kind of already had some of that experience under my belt. Now, I'm not going to say I wasn't nervous, but sometimes you have to fake it till you make it. And that's what I did a lot of the time. Just, okay, here we go. I'm just going to go out there and I'm going to do my thing, whatever my thing is. That doesn't mean I wasn't I, nervous, okay? <laughs> but sometimes you have to push yourself out there. Yeah, no, I think that's true. And we're looking at pictures as we uh, chat with Liz Bruner. Uh, of her successful career. We're looking at pictures that I'll have you comment on. First, let's go to the right on my screen, David Ortiz, who uh, is a Hall of Famer these days and excited to be uh, an amazing presence. Tell us about that picture, where and when, if you remember, and also sure, about I do. being this Absolutely. guy that's larger than life. Well, I was often the MC for the Red Sox Foundation, Fenway to the Runway. 
And that was a fashion show luncheon with a lot of the, the wives, the girlfriends of many of the players. And so what was wonderful is they were the models. The women were the models in the show and I was one of the MCs and commenting on the outfits. And sometimes their husbands or partners would show up. And in this case, this particular year, I don't recall what year that was, but David Ortiz came and supported the organization and his wife at the time, Tiffany. And so that's how I got to meet him. And he, was, he couldn't have been nicer. He couldn't have been nicer. And so I'm very, I'm very proud that I have that photo because he was such a Hall of Famer. He was such a fantastic player, so, so involved in the community. And for him to come and support the Red Sox Foundation like that, as many of the players have done, is really special. Well, in most cases, in your position and in mine, you meet these people because you're there and they're there. In the other case of the, the picture on your screen, folks, there you are in the White House with President Obama. And yes. it, it was fascinating to read in your book uh, about the process of getting to <laughs> that point, because it's certainly a, a lot of legwork. Let's talk about that, if you would. That interview took me four years to get Jordan. <laughs> and it started with me writing the White House, sending an email to the communications office blindly because I didn't have a name. There was, there was no way to sort of know who to send an a email to. It was a generic blind email. And people made fun of me all the time. They're like, oh, there goes Liz. She's right in the White House again. I thought, okay, fine, you know, make fun of me all you want. <laughs> And then when President Obama was elected for his second term, you know, I continued to thought, I'm just going to keep trying. What do I have to lose? Absolutely nothing. Just a little time sending another email. Well, one day I finally got a response and I got a response that had a name attached to it. And not only did it have a name attached to it, this particular individual who was now working in the White House press office knew me from Boston, knew of my work at Channel 5 and wrote back to me and said, Let's make this happen. Oh my gosh, I was over the moon to say the least. And then once it was confirmed that I was going, it was a whirlwind of about 48 hours of having to, you know, what's my social security number and having all this clearance that I had to go through and then getting to the White House and having to be there really early in the morning, I think eight o'clock and my interview wasn't until 2.30. And then I was gonna do live shots at five, 5.36 and 11. It was a long day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But you know what, Jordan, I will never forget that day. And no matter your politics, it is an honor and a privilege to interview a sitting president. And what was so special about that day, besides all the questions that I had to ask, I thought, how could I connect with this man? How could I, on some human level, connect with him? So I decided when I started my questioning, he walked into the room and he said, hello, Liz, nice to meet you. And I said, hello, Mr. President, it's nice to meet you too. Or should I say aloha? And I did that because he was born in Hawaii. And as we now know from your listeners have heard, I was raised in the island. So that was a nice moment together. And then the end of the interview, after all my so-called questions that I had to ask for the news department, I saved one to the very end, which was, you are the father of two teenage daughters and the president of this country, which is harder, being a dad of teenage daughters or being the president and running the country. And he laughed and he said he was lucky he had two great daughters. But you know what, Jordan, that's a moment that most people remember from all the, the four stories that I did that day. They remember yeah. that. Well, I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned and you're helping people in your current business, uh, with Bruner Communications. There's a lot of lessons there about relating to your audience, uh, connecting on a human level. There's a little uh, logo for Bruner Academy uh, that people can Google and find out more about. But uh, fascinating uh, study. Before we move into what you're doing today, we're just days away from the running of the Boston Marathon the 2022 yeah. version in person with real people. We're very excited about that. But uh, one cannot, if you're from here and if you covered this story, one cannot escape what happened back in 2013. You write about that and other issues in the book. People have this sensation that uh, the people on TV particularly are rather plastic and just news readers, but it means a lot more when you're yeah. in the midst of a story. And we don't have a lot of time, but you want to share some of your thoughts on that? I'll be as brief as I can because that particular day, I had just returned back from vacation. I'd been gone the week before and I had sent several stories to be edited. 
while I was away. And so I wanted to get out of the mayhem because I was living at that time literally blocks from the finish line of the Boston Marathon. So I got to the station early, my hair in a ponytail, no makeup on. I wasn't there more than 10 minutes when I'm, I'm hearing people run down the hall, where's Liz, where's Liz? There's been an explosion at the finish line. I went on the air. I went on the air right away, virtually knowing nothing. And I was on the air for the next, I don't know, 12 hours, 13 hours, something like that. And what was so, it was so unbelievable because there was so much happening moment by moment with that particular story. And then I was not allowed to go home at first. And then there were, were national guardsmen with their, their rifles and their assault weapons and everything. We, we thought we were looking for a terrorist. And then I would look out my dining room window and, and I would see the mayhem. I would see the debris from the, the explosions. I would see forensic experts in their sterile white suits walking hand in hand on top of the Boston Public Library looking for any type of debris. I would look out and see the memorial that was growing at Copley Square. I felt like I couldn't escape. I was talking about it 24 seven when I was at work and I'd come home and be blasted with it in my face. It was an unbelievable story to cover, and I'm, I'm honored that I had the opportunity to cover it, but it was one of the hardest stories to cover. You just said you were honored to do it. There's another just quick aside about your TV career after 9-11, and we all mm -hmm. remember it so well if we lived through it. Uh, you did a series of follow-up stories, and I read about it in the book. We talked about it on my show that really meant more than a lot of the original reporting on what happened because everybody knew that uh share with us a bit about that if you would my role ended up being talking with the victim's family so at six months we had our first gathering and it was so raw the emotion was so raw still in that room and then i saw them again at one year two years three years five years and then finally 10 years a 10-year anniversary and to, to see the transformation and how far some had come, how far others had not come. I mean, I was honored and it was such a privilege to share in that journey with them. I mean, it was emotional, it was raw, and it was beautiful all at the same time. Yeah, uh, sensitivity to people's uh, emotions and feelings during critical times. Uh, I know that that's very important to you. It's very important to me too. I mean, first and foremost, we're human beings. <laughs> let's 100%, always remember yes. that. So, so let's get to the stuff you're doing now, which is very mm -hmm. exciting. You've got your own podcast. I want you to promote that uh, first of all, and the fact that you're having a ball doing it, as I knew you mm -hmm. would. Uh, yeah. What are what are some of the, the the themes that run throughout, and and talk about some of the recent shows, if you would. Well, the name of the show is Live Your Best Life with Liz Bruner. And I believe we're in 140 countries. I think we, we've crossed over the 30,000 download mark and we're- just but are you in Wyoming? Are you in I, Wyoming? I believe we are. Dan would be able to know that. He's my digital you, producer. You are. Trust me, I'm the only one that was kept out of Wyoming. <laughs> No, it, it's really fun because I always loved interviewing people when I was on television. And so this gives me that opportunity. And I have no one telling me that I have to ask this or ask that, or I have to cut it off at, you know, five minutes, 10 minutes, whatever. I can talk as long as I want. And most of the people who are guests on my show have what I call transformed their life in some way, shape or form. It could be a, a path of changing careers from one thing to another. They've recreated themselves. It could be that they've risen above tough times and they are now sort of sharing their message. It's, it's all of the above. And I've been really blessed to have amazing guests. Robin Roberts of Good Morning America, Jack Canfield of the Chicken Soup for the Soul series, Sergeant Segbert King, who uh, were, uh, was a soldier in Afghanistan and his legs were blown off. His story is unbelievable. Uh, we have Mark Devine, who's a former Navy SEAL. Wow, powerful, powerful words from him. And I just feel blessed that I'm having such great guests. Marcy Shimoff, Brian Tracy. I could go on and on and on. I enjoy listening to them all and having wonderful conversations with them. And you've developed nice relationships with the guests so much so that Jack Canfield, who's very tough to pin down, he's the most active publisher I know of, with the Chicken Soup for the series, Chicken Soup for the Soul series. He did the the uh, the forward. The he did. He did. Yeah. It was. I was very brave and asked him. It took me a year to get him on my show, by the way, on my podcast. And again, it was just how do I find a way to maneuver in? How am I going to get there? I eventually did. 
And you're after a patient the show, lady. You you don't you wait four years to get the president. You'll wait a year for Jack Camp. I'm glad you didn't well, wait a year to say yes to this. <laughs> it's called perseverance, Jordan. And thank you for yes. inviting me. Now, yes. when I when I had done the show, the podcast with Jack, he was so complimentary, saying that this was one of the best interviews he'd ever done. I was so prepared. I'd done my homework, and he really appreciated that. And that is something that I was always known for. I I do my homework on my guests. I read their books. I, I mean, I do whatever I can to to really facilitate a wonderful conversation with the guests. And that's what it is. It's a conversation. And so after the interview, I thought, okay, maybe I'll ask him for an endorsement. I don't know. And then uh, a woman by the name of Patty Aubrey, who's worked with Jack for many, many years, she started off as his secretary and now is you know, running his company. She was on the show as well. And she said, you should ask Jack. I said, ask Jack for what? And she said, ask him to do the forward. I said, um, okay. <laughs> and I had to be brave and do that too, but I'm so glad I did. And he wrote back and he said he would consider it, but he said he would have to read it because after all, it was his reputation and his name and he would not write a forward unless he'd read it. I'd be like, of course, I wouldn't want you to do anything else. And then the day I got it, Jordan, I was just, I was so, I was so deeply touched. And he said, Congratulations on writing a great book. Here's your forward. I went, wow. Thank you. <laughs> if awesome. you don't ask, you don't get. And I think that's a great lesson. And but asking in a way that is gracious, I think that makes sense. Before well, we you know, uh, one more one more point about that though. His his success principles book number 17 is ask. So I said, oh. I'm gonna press, I'm gonna practice number 17. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Very relatable. Uh, Dan's coming back in a moment. Before we wrap things up, though, uh, you teach and and advise and coach people on poise, on communication, on etiquette, on all the key things that make for success. And people can see Dare, Rockstar, Bruner Academy. Um, in a nutshell, what are we helping people with? What are you doing daily that's making people's lives better? Well, the first thing is all of those that you're looking at right now are on BrunerAcademy.com. Those are my online learning courses. Now, I also work with people, Bruner Communications, one-on-one -on -one and facilitate workshops. And it's all about presence. It's all about leadership. It's about presentation skills. It's about storytelling. It's about storytelling. How can you get your message out there in a way that you are communicating, you're connecting, and you're engaging with your audience, whether it's one-on-one, -on -one, whether it's in front of a large crowd, whether it's on a conference call, whether you're on a panel, whether you're a moderator, whether you have to give a speech, it's all of the above. How can you make that pitch? How can you make that presentation in a way that connects with your audience? And being able to share my expertise that I've honed from my years on television and all the experiences I have had, to be able to share that knowledge with people, it's just such a blessing. And I love the fact that I see the progress in people but then when they see it in themselves, Jordan, it's the best feeling in the world. It's the best feeling in the world. Yeah, the, those of us who um, open up the refrigerator door and when the light comes on, do 20 minutes, me, uh, we take it for granted that uh, everyone feels comfortable doing these things. But I love the fact that you're giving people an opportunity to dare to, to just take a few steps forward and change their lives. And you've done it very, very successfully. Look who's back, Danny hey, Boy. Hey, Dan. Hey, everybody. Um, I'd like to say that, um, as always, Robert Baum is with us. Robert, thank you for being here. Melissa Kramer, yes. Betty Mahoney Wilkins, uh, oh, Harvey, Sklar, Harvey Sklar, Sklar. Mm -hmm. sorry, Harvey, I'm sorry. I did that last time to you, too. Mary Wolfson is here. Michael oh, Sullivan there. is here. Yeah. Um, hi. hi, everyone. Yeah, Denise Bastoni, George Knight, Alan Boudreau, Jack Walsh, Joe Benito, Christopher Barasa, it has blown, the feed has blown up. And I think I want to put a question up for Liz. There was a question for Liz and Robert Baum sure. asked it. And it's a really good question. So let's see if I can get that up on the screen here. Uh, okay. Has your guest found the post-pandemic world to be more challenging or less challenging and an environment world in which to navigate or adapt? And I think that's a great question. And I think you have well done, answered right. that for many people. So the question is of how, how have I adapted? Is that correct? Yeah. Or how do you think the world uh, is, okay. it, yeah, just in general, what are, what are your thoughts on post-pandemic? Well, I, I, like many people had to pivot because my entire business pre-pandemic was in person. 
And so I had to completely pivot and learn how to do this virtually and then teach other people how to do this virtually and to do it well, because a lot of people still, two years after all this began, still don't know how to do virtual well. So there was a, there was a lot of shifting that had to go on. And for me, it was pretty scary initially because when the pandemic first started and we were looking at, this was February, March of 2020, I had clients lined up and events lined up through June. They all completely fell off my calendar and it didn't pick back up again until the end of that year. And then 2021 was still very hard. Now my business is booming again, thank you God. But it was very, very hard. And, and to the point of, I didn't even pay myself the entire year of 2020 until the last month of the year. Mm -hmm. It was more important for me to pay my people and keep my business afloat than it was to pay me. And that's a mistake. I've learned that. <laughs> you have to pay yourself first. In fact, I just did a little video for um, a podcast that, uh, about that. You have to pay yourself first. And speaking I, of... Uh, Go ahead, Dan. Uh, speaking of your uh, business, and here is your website. Good, I was hoping and to do that. And lizbruner.com. I encourage everyone to go here. Uh, sign up for the email. Uh, Liz, you don't bombard yeah. people. Well, you give good information. So join the, yeah. the mailing list right here. Uh, there's lots to do and see here. There is a Bruner Academy. And here's where you can learn more about the online courses or work with Liz one-on-one -on -one in some of the other sections here. And your podcast, Live Your Best Life with Liz Bruner, is here on this page as well. As well as all the other shows that I'm on lately promoting my book. <laughs> which, is, my. which is, I got to show this, dare to own you. <laughs> yeah, and here are the guests. Look at all these wonderful people that you've interviewed. Uh, as you had mentioned, Jack Canfield was one of them. But if you want to hear these episodes, yep, just go right to lizbruner.com. There's a nice little player right there. You can listen and learn more. And of course, you are on all the major platforms. We yep. encourage people to follow you, rate and review the show, and share it with others. Yeah, I really, I, I just, that's my whole point is my, my whole goal yeah. right now is to teach, motivate, and inspire people to live their best life, whatever that means for you. Yeah. And whether it's on my podcast, whether it's on my email list, however you follow me on social media, that's my goal right now. That's, that's a personal goal and professional goal. And, and I just wanted to address the question as well, and just in, in 10 seconds say, the fact that we're all still here, those of us who mm. made it through, pat yourselves on the back. It's been a rough go for everybody. There you go, she's patting herself yeah. on the back, it's so sweet. Um, but Liz, you're a delight. As we know, uh, you and I will see each other again real soon at, at various events. Nice to be out and about again. And congratulations on all your success, the book, Dare to Own You, and all the other great things happening. We, uh, we love you a lot here. Oh, thank you both very much for having me on the show today. It's always a pleasure to be with you and to see you. And yes, I know our paths will cross very soon in person once again. Be well. Dan, awesome. thank you for everything. Appreciate it as always. Uh, and another Lunch with Jordan in a couple of weeks on Facebook Live. Till next time, as always, be well so you can do good. Take Goodbye, care. everybody.